Hi, I'm Jason Wachab, founder and CEO of My Buddy Green, the best-selling author of Wealth, and your host for the My Buddy Green podcast, where I'll be bringing you deep and insightful dialogues with some of the greatest minds in wellness. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star review, comment, and share with your friends and family. And don't forget to visit us at mybuddygreen.com for your daily dose of wellness. In today's age of massive grocery stores and fast food on every corner, it can be difficult to feel connected to the food on your plate. Thrive Market is on a mission to change that. The online marketplace is making healthy living easy and affordable for everyone by stocking a highly curated catalog of thousands of food and household items for less. And right now, they're offering an amazing deal to new users. Get $60 of free organic groceries plus free shipping. Go to thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen now and you'll notice that more than 70% of their catalog cannot be found on stores like Amazon. Let's break down how it works. Thrive does the heavy lifting for you and allows you to filter based on the values that you care about. Click through 90 categories like organic, non-GMO, and BPA-free to find out your favorite foods and natural products, all at prices up to 50% less than those you'll find in the grocery store. They offer the same savings on non-food items too. I'm talking eco-friendly cleaning supplies, non-toxic beauty products, kitchen staples, and home goods. Visit thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen to unlock $60 of free organic groceries plus free shipping. That's right, $60 in free organic curated groceries. Again, that's thrivemarket.com slash mindbuddygreen. Once you start using Thrive Market, you'll wonder what you ever did without it. Hi, I'm Colleen Wachup, co-founder and chief brand officer at MindBodyGreen. I know that leggings are so much more than workout clothes. I wear them to yoga, of course, but I wear them just about everywhere else, too. Fabletics, co-founded by Kate Hudson, is premium activewear at a great value. You get performance, quality, and style for two to three times less than other activewear brands. Fabletics leggings are made for every body. No one is left out here with sizes from extra extra small to 3X in petite, regular, and tall lengths. Whatever your lifestyle, Fabletics fits you. When you visit the site for the first time, you're given a style quiz. Then Fabletics personalizes your shopping experience so your favorite styles rise to the top. You can shop as a guest or become a VIP. Spoiler, becoming a VIP is by far the best way to shop. VIPs save 40 to 50% off retail prices and gain access to tons of other exclusive sales and perks. I signed up as a VIP and it's awesome. I found a pair with mesh panels that kept me cool during heated yoga flows and a floral pattern pair so cute I'm wearing them all spring instead of my sundresses. Every month, Fabletics releases new looks so you're always in style. And when you're a VIP, the experience is even cooler. You'll get a serious discount on all the workout wear you could ever want. Go to fabletics.com slash mbg now to get two pairs of their amazing leggings for just $24. Seriously, these are great leggings. They're a $99 value and you'll get two for only $24 when you join at fabletics.com slash mbg. That's fabletics.com slash mbg. Hey everybody, I just want to take a quick moment to thank you all for listening to the podcast and to say that we want to listen to you. So if you have any questions, any dream guests, we are all ears. I would love to hear from you. So ask me anything and stay tuned for the answers or your dream guests on this very podcast. Send your questions to podcast at mindbodygreen.com. That's podcast.com. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks so much. And let's go back to the podcast. My guest today is entrepreneur Adam Lowry, who in 2000 co-founded Method with his former roommate with the goal of revolutionizing green cleaning. Within two years, Method was in Target stores nationwide. After Method was acquired, Adam turned his attention to the food industry, teaming up with chemical engineer Neil Renninger to form Ripple Foods, the first pea milk in the U.S. which has expanded into a whole line of dairy alternatives. Whether he's working on cleaner, greener products or more sustainable, tasty foods, Adam is committed to one thing, creating positive change and doing so in an environmentally responsible way. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. 
So let's go back in time to the start of your first company, which most people will probably know, Method. And what was that, 2000? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, started in early 2000. Yeah. What, what was the inspiration there? And well, the inspiration for, for Method really came out of my frustrations with previous work. And that's kind of typical <laughs> for an entrepreneur, right? You get frustrated with something and you want to try to change something so you go a different direction. For me, before starting Method, I was a climate scientist. And I was a climate scientist because I wanted to work on uh, environmental issues and have an impact. That was my motivation. In the course of being a climate scientist for four years or so, I realized a couple of things. The first was that I was largely pre preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, great science doesn't lead to good policy in this country. It didn't then, and it still doesn't now, unfortunately. And so the people that were consuming the work that I was a part of were other scientists that were already concerned about the problem, and it wasn't really going beyond that. And then the second thing was just as a green consumer at the time, before the green consumer was even really a, a moniker of any, sure. of any kind, um, every product that I tried to buy to live a little bit more responsibly was just awful. <laughs> it was just, you know, whatever it was, it was too expensive, it didn't work, or it tasted bad, it was brown. It was always brown. Um, and, you know, I just, I just thought um, that maybe business would be a better way to create change on kind of a mass scale. And so I got together with a buddy of mine from high school, actually, Eric Ryan, my co-founder at Method, and, uh, and we started the business quite literally in the most ironic place you would ever think of a cleaning products company to start, which was a bachelor pad of five early 20s guys um, living together in San Francisco. Uh, started the company out of there. And so w w how, how did it – was it one day like, okay, we need to do something? You start messing around in the kitchen or – yeah, I mean, there was that, but it, it evolved a little bit, and it evolved to that. So Eric and, and I, uh, like I said, we were high school friends, and we kind of, by happenstance, uh, got back connected in San Francisco. Uh, he had recently moved there, and we, and we got connected, and one thing led to another, and I had a roommate move out. He moved in, and we just started chatting about our careers and things, and, and really one thing led to another. He had this idea around – he came from an advertising background. He had this idea about you know, why are there some categories where the brands are really dull and uninteresting uh, and others where they're not, you know, where they're cool and sexy. And I was had the frustrations I just described, and we started putting two and two together and kind of coalescing around, well, what is the most toxic and the ugliest consumer category we can think <laughs> of? And it happened to be clean. And we, uh, we, we basically jumped in, you know, you know, head first, both of us. Uh, and that's when the tinkering with, you know, lotions and potions in the, uh, <laughs> in the kitchens and bathrooms at that, uh, flat in San Francisco started happening. So you find target and Kareem Rashid and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish it were that easy. <laughs> yeah. We actually wrote a book about this back in 2011 yep. that, um, that has all of the, all of the warts and trials and tribulations and stuff. But I actually think that that's the stuff. I mean, maybe it's with the benefit of hindsight that but um, that's, that's really the fun of starting a business is all that stuff sure. that happens and responding to it. Um, it is stressful at the time. But, uh, no, we, we started the business just by making products literally ourselves and in beer pitchers, actually, is where the way we first started. <laughs> like any good business. Yeah, like any good Yeah. <laughs> and uh, started selling it door-to-door -to, -door to grocery stores around the Bay Area, which was challenging enough even to just – get sure. someone to talk to us and we eventually built it up sort of like a paper route kind of 20 stores in the bay area and hand selling products and handwriting invoices and that sort of thing and it was a couple steps after that that we you know started talking to big name <laughs> designers and started talking to big customers too and so method becomes this amazing uh pretty large company that you end up selling and exiting and you know walk me through that, that process and 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 then leading us to the idea yeah. for Ripple. Yeah, I mean, first the first thing I would say is the way I think about building a business is never to sell it. And that's a, a foundational principle for me. It, it is also true that when you raise venture capital, which I've had to do, <laughs> yes. um, you will need to get return for those shareholders. Um, yep. And so 
the lens that we always took with would we get acquired or would there be some sort of ownership change is, well, there'll probably be an ownership change at some, time, at some point. And we need to make sure that after the ownership change that we can do what we want to do better than we could before it. And mm -hmm. what those things are are deepen the social and environmental mission of Method Products, grow financially better and faster than we could before, had to, of course, be good for the people that worked uh, at mm -hmm. Method at the time. And then lastly, and most importantly, that the price was right for the shareholders. Um, and without going into too much detail, there were times when offers presented themselves that didn't check all four of those sure. boxes. Uh, and in 2012, an opportunity uh, presented itself that did check all of those boxes, and we decided to move forward. Um, the business sold actually to another private mm -hmm. family investment office. And uh, I, I, I always like to, to say that you know, the the best evidence uh, that we were able to deepen our social and environmental mission after the business sold was the fact that we built uh, a lead platinum certified uh, factory to manufacture our products in wow. downtown Chicago, renewably powered, water neutral, landfill free, grows leafy green vegetables in a food desert on its roof, um, and the first factory of any kind built in the south side of Chicago. It's a big over, deal. Yeah, in over 30 years. Huge, you know, sort of once in a career um, type of opportunity that was that came to us because after we sold the business, now instead of being venture backed with a razor thin balance sheet, <laughs> we had enough resources to actually make investments on a much longer term horizon. Uh, and the impacts of that continue to grow and be tremendous for for the community and, and for the environment it's a great outcome i love i love your four your your four criteria yeah i mean it, at the end of the day it's because there is a whole discussion that happens out there with whatever label you want to put on it green sustainable sure. socially uh, um, driven mission driven businesses about well are you going to sell out right and i've always thought that that while that happens, it's also kind of a false uh, premise because at the end of the day, business owner, the ownership of business changes all the time. Mm -hmm. And the, I think the first thing is that you need to recognize that. And then secondly, understand that that is an opportunity and a threat. And if sure. the business is going to change ownership, how, are, how is the business going to be better after than it was before? Um, and if the answer is it, it isn't going to be, um, then it's probably not the right thing to do. Sure. Well, as a mission driven company too, you want to change the world. And if someone's acquiring you, it's most likely they have more distribution channels that can help you scale the business and affect more lives at a more reasonable price point. So as a mission driven company, you'd say like, wait, we can change more lives, lower price point, more access. Like what's Exactly. Not to like. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it's, and I've said this before, I think it's pointless to make green products for green people. Um, right. <laughs> I think we need to get a much bigger tent. Sure. Uh, and obviously method strategy, ripple food strategy is very much the yeah. same in that we're trying to create mainstream relevance for products sure. that are better for you and better for the world. And that means that some of our most passionate advocates are the, you know, the deep greenies. Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about getting everybody else in um, using, you know, just great product as as the, the entry point for that rather than just kind of sure. keeping it small and, and you know, preach, just you know, preach the choir, build a bigger church. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, that's the reason I started Method. I was yeah. preaching to the converted um, when I worked at the Carnegie Institution, which was a climate science thing. And I don't want to do that in business. Right. So let's segue to Ripple. So you, 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 you have this, you know, work your tail off for a long time, you know, a decade. <laughs> you're, and, no, you're no stranger to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, most people would say like, okay, I'm going to relax, take it easy. I'm done. But no, you go right back in. <laughs> I, I'm curious what that conversation was with your, with your family. And, yeah. And, and yeah, that. yeah. So, yeah, no, it's funny with my wife. It wasn't that much of a conversation. I think she just kind of, no, we've been together for 23 years or oh, something wow. like that. Congratulations. So. <laughs> That's another podcast interview, Your Secrets. Yeah, yeah. yeah maybe I'll write a book about that. Um, but uh, uh, no, I think she knows me well enough to know that um, being idle is not one of, I don't do well with that. Yeah. Um, and also I'm just, I'm just really driven to try to, to, to just try to do remarkable, interesting things. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, there wasn't actually much of a, I mean, the transition was me working kind of both at both businesses for a while <laughs> and trying to kind of transition from one to another. But, um, the opportunity presented itself with ripple and it was one that was just, uh, so incredible that I just, I just couldn't not pursue it. So let, let's just, for people who don't know, ripples, alternative milk mm -hmm. made for made from something that a lot of people may not be familiar it's, with so just walk through the whole yes yes it's pea milk yes um and but, it's delicious <laughs> one of my favorite alternative <laughs> beverages so i have it every morning thank you thank you um but what makes ripple unique is not peas i'll actually kind of back yep. up and tell a little bit about this so um it was about 20 it was late 2014 and we had built this factory in chicago for method and um method continued to grow and doing amazing things and i was starting to think about uh where what would i do next and of course my thing is how do you use business to create social and environmental impact mm -hmm. and i had been recently getting really interested in the food space like food and there's even bigger impacts there. It's much more sure. personal even than the chemicals that you have in your home. Uh, and a friend of mine uh, from back in the method days, um, and there's a funny story about this that remind me to tell, um, Neil Renninger came to me and he was working at a venture firm uh, that was investing in the food space. And he had an idea about a technology. He's a PhD, a PhD biochemist. So you've a, got a PhD biochemist and a climate scientist. Yeah. Up to no good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he had this idea that, um, you know, protein, all proteins are tasteless. They don't have any flavor. And it's a little counterintuitive because most of the time you think protein, you think burger yeah. or a umami type flavor from soy or something like that. And, but that's not true. They're, they're really big molecules. And so they don't, uh, hit your taste receptors. They're, they have no flavor. And so there was no reason that plant-based foods, which we all know are inherently, uh, better for the environment and in many cases are better for you as well. Um, there were no reason that, that plant-based foods ha needed to taste planty mm -hmm. and be only things that people that were into planty were going to eat. Right. <laughs> And for me, the light bulb went on. That was very much like Method, right? Method uses used design and fragrance to sure. make a green cleaning product relevant to a mainstream audience. Within the plant-based food sector, we need more plant-based food options that are really delicious, period. Mm -hmm. At the end of the it, and No one likes literally eating styrofoam period. or cardboard. Right, right. I mean, food, food has to be good yep. or it's not going to scale. And so here was a technology that was really the secret to making better food, better for you, better for the world food, taste a lot better. Uh, and then when we dug into the category, that's when things got really interesting because, again, much like Method, I didn't know much at all about the plant-based dairy space. Mm -hmm. But when we started digging in, 90% of the products sold in this space have very little or no protein at all. In other words... Yeah. They're missing the number one nutritional benefit of the thing they're replacing. And kind of everybody knows that nut milks and plant-based milks are generally thinner and sort of waterier yep. and chalkier than, than what they're substituting. So you have this situation where this large and growing category of dairy alternatives that were really awful alternatives to dairy. Mm -hmm. And ironically, in many cases also – really horrible from an environmental standpoint. Sure. You know, if you look at the water footprint of almond milk, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's not like good. We gallons. can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a gallon of over a gallon of water to grow a single almond, just one almond. Um, and a and single gallon of water to grow one almond, one almond. And we've got a little bit of a water problem in California. Yeah. And 99% <laughs> of all of the almonds grown in the United States, 80% of all of the almonds grown in the entire planet are grown in the Central Valley of California, sure. where there is it's no like water. It's like half a million people without what it's insane. Which then yeah. brings you to the carbon footprint sure. of almonds, which is high because you have to transport water to where there isn't any water. So point is, the white space was huge in this category. And that's why we started with milk products, with milk substitutes with uh, Ripple. And um, the reason we started with peas, or peas are high, they're, they're a legume, and they're high in protein. And so we could create a milk that had the same protein content as milk, a plant-based milk, mm -hmm. that had the same protein content as milk, 
um, was rich and creamy and delicious and had much, much better environmental credentials with it. Um, their peas are grown in places where it rains, um, so you don't, generally don't have to irrigate. Very, very low carbon footprint. It's almost two orders of magnitude lower um, carbon and water like, uh, almond milk. Sure. Yeah. So are you like, why hasn't anyone done this? Well, we knew why no one had done this, and that's because <laughs> peas taste like peas. Right. <laughs> and if you make a milk out of peas, it tastes pretty awful because you get all that, you know, pea-type flavor. The reason soy milk tastes like – it's the same reason soy milk tastes like soy beans, sure. right? But because of the technology that Neil developed, which um, is uh, – so we call it riptine, ripple mm -hmm. riptine. What we do is we just extract – the pure protein from, uh, we can actually do it from any plant source, but we do it from peas right now. And because it's flavorless, we can make a milk out of it, we can make yogurts out of it that tastes really creamy and delicious and actually don't taste like peas at all. And that's really kind of the secret sauce. So how long did it take you to get to market from idea to formulation to... Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot involved in this. Yeah, there is, <laughs> but um, fortunately, Neil knows what he's doing, and, and we've hired a really good team, too. Um, we started the company at the very, very end of 2014, yeah. and we were on shelves at Whole Foods in May of 2016. So wow. inside of two years. Wow. Or actually, inside of 18 months. So, no, so today, you've got... How many skews in milk, and you just launched yogurt? Let's yeah, we've got we've got uh, five different types of milk, which is just a basic segmentation of the category: regular, sure. unsweetened, chocolate, vanilla, that sort of thing. We have a line of half and halves. Yep, and it's a true dairy half and half. It's not like a sweet coffee creamer. It's a, you can cook with it. We have a kids' version of our milk that comes in sort of a lunchbox friendly, mm -hmm. shelf stable version, and then we just launched yogurts as well. It's actually the first yogurt that has the same amount of protein it was first non-dairy yogurt has the same amount of protein as a as a greek dairy yogurt 12 grams per cup what's next what other well, like there's lots of what you can do here and yeah yeah so i mentioned the riptine technology yep. which and and that in in a nutshell is what we no pun intended <laughs> it's not a nut is we make the purest plant protein anywhere in the world that's what Ripple does. And so we can make really nutritious foods that taste really delicious. Now, the opportunity for pure protein from plants mm -hmm. is massive. I mean, just massive. And this is why sure. Neil and I are excited to start, you know, ha have started this business. That said, there's more opportunity for, for that technology than we'll be able to exploit on our own. So in the name of focus, I've made the focus mistake as well. We can talk about that. Yeah. But in the name of focus, we're focused on the U.S. market, and we're focused on dairy alternatives for now. And there's tons of opportunity and room to grow within, think about across the kitchen, um, your entire dairy regimen. Those are all places that we can play and we intend to go. Sure. So butters and all that. So, like if you think you about plant-based protein, I'm thinking meat, just the explosion of, of the plant-based meat in, in Silicon Valley. And, and I love the use word technology. And th there, there's definitely a gold rush in terms of innovation and what's happening with plant-based food. Yeah. Some of it good, some of it. Exactly. Eh. <laughs> yeah. Some of it good, some of it bad. Yeah. And I mean, what we're really trying to do is we don't sell ourselves as a tech company, right? right. We don't sell technology. We sell food. Right. Um, we're, well, we're some people have made that mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we're a food company, sure. but we are technology. Well, enabled you have something that's much. proprietary and unique. Yeah, and we're, what we're trying to do strategically from a business standpoint is we're trying to fortress the business both with our brand, mm -hmm. creating a brand ripple that's about how the little things matter and they add up and dairy-free the way it should be. And also fortressed by the technology, which is if you want to create a pea milk, if you right. want to create a high protein plant based milk that doesn't taste bad, right now we've got that can do that. Sure. And I'm sure others will come along, but we're fortressing the business both through technology and through brand. Sure. So you mentioned focus. Yeah. Talk about that. What have you learned about focus? Uh, it's easy to lose it. <laughs> uh, you know, growing a business is is a ton of fun, and there's 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 always opportunity around and uh, most entrepreneurs are get can get a little drunk on opportunity from time sure. to time and uh, at method we made a couple mistakes well we made many mistakes but from a from a focus standpoint in about sort of between about 05 and 08 we had it started we were having some nice success and so we 
And our customers, this would be uh, retailers, consumers being the end consumer sure. of our product, so Target and grocery stores and that sort of thing, um, saw the success we were having and said, hey, we would love you to go methodize, right, using method as a verb, which was cool, all these other categories. And as as product designers and entrepreneurs, we were we just thought that was incredible. And it is an incredible opportunity to have the su- support of major national retailers to go reinvent other categories. Uh, and we did it. And we got into about seven or eight different categories by about 07, 08. Uh, and then uh, there was the financial crisis. Sure. Um, that was not the root cause. I'll be um, careful to point out, but maybe a contributing factor. But we had, you know, the kind of the bottom fell out of the market and we had more businesses. We were in more businesses than we could really sustain ourselves. And so we had to retrench and to get out of some businesses. We had to lay off about 25% of our staff and shrink the business by about 30%. I had to lay off one of the groomsmen in my wedding. Oh my God. What was that like? Uh, that was the, I, that was probably the low point in my career. It was, I mean, a really good friend of mine still is a really good friend of mine. And, um, yeah, we, we had to let him go, which was, uh, and you know, the irony of it was, and this is maybe going a little off topic, but when you hire a team of senior people, you know, you got to support those people. And my groomsmen reported to one of the team members that we had hired. I didn't really agree with the move, but you, you know, sure you have to as a leader of a business support what your management team wants to do. And, uh, you know, so it was even harder because I didn't, I didn't think it was the right move, but anyway, I had to do it. And, um, yeah, so that was, that was a tough time. It takes a long time for a business's culture to really, to, to recover from that type of blow. Um, fortunately we were able to do it, but we, we focused on the core and really started growing the core business. And the business was much stronger as a result of having built depth and real capability in our core businesses over the sort of 08 to 12 timeframe. So what was the biggest lesson you took from method and brought to ripple in terms of how you run the business? I mean, there are so many we could spend (laughs) this entire interview talking about them. Um, with respect to focus, it's that opportunities rarely go away. Uh, well, I, sh- I should say it this way. A lot of times I felt like at Method we pursued opportunities because they were there and we were worried that they were going to go away sure. if we didn't jump on them. And I, I don't think that that's the case necessarily. The, the landscape may change, but if you've got a really great business and a strong brand, the opportunity isn't going to go away. It might change a little bit. But if you wait till the right time, you have a better chance of being successful than if you just go in because you want to occupy the space before anyone else does. That that was a big learning. It's a great. There's that great Steve Jobs quote. It's focus is about saying no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So true. Yeah. I mean, I I think we probably this is similar, but at Method we probably went international too soon. And yeah. I ran those businesses both in Europe and in, and in Asia. And they're successful businesses, but there were a lot of growing pains and a lot of distraction from the core business in North America as a result of when we decided to pursue those opportunities. And I think that they're, with Ripple Foods, it's already right. reared its head. <laughs> you know, people, we have a ton of interest from a very fast growing and, and developing plant based market in Asia, for example. And we've said, you know what, for now, right. we got, we got to, we got to stick to our knitting and, and build a good business here. And if we do that, uh, that opportunity will still be there for us. So how do you see the food space changing being in this market for, or just generally involved in natural products for almost 20 years? Mm-hmm. You know, how do you see it evolving? Where's the future? Uh, yeah. The, do you mean of the sort of overall uh, natural and organic uh, space or yeah, food specifically? Both. I, both. I'm interested in both. And then also I want to get a new environment environment and what's happening there. Too. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, I think so positives and negatives, right? I think that po- uh, on the positive side, there has just been an explosion of innovation and ideas within the natural and organic space and the natural and organic space broadly, food and beyond is 
where 100% or sometimes more than 100% of the growth of consumer categories is. And that Mm -hmm. is absolutely fantastic. And that is the momentum we're seeing towards a healthier world and a healthier planet. Mm -hmm. That said, there's, there's a lot of people doing it for real and there's a lot of people faking it. Um, and can tell what they were at Expo West. (laughs) Yeah, sure. Sure. (laughs) And, you know, I, I come from a scientific background and, you know, I, I, I sometimes get a little tired, honestly, of the sort of romanticizing of nature and the bucolic, you know, type of pastoral scenes (laughs) and all that kind of BS that, um, a lot of brands will use to try to sort of appeal to, a green consumer. I think we need to get a lot more real about the fact that at the end of the day, we got to get a lot more people eating a lot better stuff, not to, and, and mm-hmm. consuming. I will say even beyond the food sector, and that means you know not you know not taking shortcuts and not pretending to be this when you're Greenwashing. when you're that. Yeah, yeah, sure that if you want to call it that. Because I think that's really dangerous to the long-term scalability of what is a really uh, important movement for really just our future and the future of the planet. Yeah, let's talk about the environmental impact, too, is huge as we think about food and the ecosystem and what's going on in the world. In my mind, it's sort of tough to ignore Oh yeah, the connection between the two. Mm-hmm. And why, why is that so critical, especially as you know, a parent, a mission-driven entrepreneur? Yeah. How do you think about that? Yeah, well, let me let me kind of break it down just in the in the milk business, right? So, twenty five percent of our food carbon footprint comes from dairy, humanity. Okay, about thirty percent of humanity's overall carbon footprint comes from food. Mm-hmm. So that means dairy is about eight percent of humanity's total carbon footprint. In other words, if we wanted to hold climate change to two degrees C, if everybody on the planet went plant-based and dairy alone, not, not meat, but just, sure. just went to plant-based dairy, we'd be halfway there. It's amazing. And that, that's just, you know, I mean, it's a little bit sure. dorky, right? I'm, no, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> you're, you know, our, our dear friend, Paul Hawken <laughs> yeah, yeah. and draw down. It's like three out of the four out of the top solutions and drawdown are related to food. It's, it's yeah. eat plant-based diet, food waste, regenerative ag, yeah. refrigeration, basic stuff. You yeah. don't have to just buy a hybrid to save the world. It's not right. going to happen. Right. And, and, and if you think it's preposterous that well, everybody's going to give up dairy milk, I mean, consider that humans are the only species that drinks another mammal's milk. Sure. Period. Right. So it's not that far fetched that something, I mean, obviously that's not going to happen, you know, exactly that way. But I think what I see is the future to kind of get to your question is not everyone going vegan or vegetarian, but people going way more plant-based and loving it because the food is fantastic and because it makes them feel great. Mm -hmm. And because that food is inherently um, better from an environmental standpoint, particularly on water and carbon. And what are some of the other companies in, who are doing interesting things with plant-based that you look to, you think are, hey, they're innovating over there. That's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that an, an obvious first place to look is in the meat space. Yeah. Um, these guys have been talked a lot about, a lot about uh, the Beyond Meats, yeah. uh, the impossibles of the world. And what I think is really interesting about that is opening up plant-based eating to a much more you know, mainstream audience, sure. right? Um, we're doing it in dairy. They're kind of doing it in meat. You could argue that doing it in meat is, is more sort of interesting from a, you know, from an intellectual standpoint. Yep. But I think that that stuff, what it, what it starts to do is it starts to change people's minds at a, at a really sort of psychological level mm-hmm. about what kind of eater I am. And it overcomes a lot of the stereotypes that often come along with more, natural organic type of brands or ways of eating that, you know, let's face it, some, a lot of consumers in the United States view as sort of a coastal thing. You know, Mm -hmm. I live in San Francisco, you live in New York, you know, it's like (laughs) these two guys are talking about it, but, um, but what about the middle? And I think that creating mainstream for appeal for products that are plant-based is, you know, it's where it's at. Sure. Yeah. What about the middle? Yeah. How can we all do a better job? Make good food. Yeah. Make great food. Great food wins. And, you know, we're doing it. I, I mean, we're, 
yes, we have a lot of passionate fans on the coast, but our business is a national business and we have consumers all over the place that, that love what we're doing and they, and they love it for different reasons. Um, sure. I mean, honestly, the number one reason people buy our products is because they're rich and creamy and taste like milk. Yep. Are there places in the middle of the country? I'm always curious about the cities that pop up for you guys. You're like, wow, like Houston, they're love, like kind of <laughs> cool. Like, do you have cities that pop up we here and there? Yeah, we are, we actually are doing really kind of really well in Houston. You know, what's interesting for Ripple Foods, we're doing incredibly well in the Southeast. Really? Yeah. And I would say that wasn't necessarily the case, at least not to the same degree with, with method. Sure. There is a high, higher instances of uh, eth- a higher percentage of the population there are ethnicities that are generally more lactose intolerant, mm-hmm. which could be a contributing factor, but it doesn't seem to sort of align in terms of how well sure. we're doing in those geographies. So um, we know that our brand's doing really well with Hispanic consumers. So that's fantastic. Yep. Um, but, you know, we're still learning. So I'm not sure. That's awesome. Was there a specific city in the Southeast or just the whole category? Oh, well, I mean, Miami is yep. crushing it for us, which is, which is a big one. But um, also a lot of uh, Atlanta is doing really well. And, but also some of the sort of cities, you know, the Jacksonville's, sure. and Birmingham, Alabama, some places like that are That's doing, awesome. doing better than we would have expected. That's awesome. So one of the things you've said in an interview, which, which I loved, I, when I read it, I turned to my wife, Colleen, and said, I love this. I love this quote. <laughs> So it was about work-life balance, and you, and you said, I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-life integration. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about what what that means. Yeah, I mean, I stole that from somebody, and I can't remember well, who. we'll give you but... credit for the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, so I can't claim it's an original idea, but you know, early on in my career, I always tried to balance work and life, and I just really sucked at it. And, and it and <laughs> what it, does really suck look like? Well, you know, <laughs> for me, what it looks like is not being present in whatever it is that I'm doing. So if I'm at home, I need to be present at home. And I would try to, I would try to turn work on and off mm-hmm. and I could never do it. And so I would be preoccupied or my mind would be elsewhere while I was home and being with my then girlfriend, now wife, or I was at work kind of thinking about something else because I hadn't been able to turn that off. And so what I learned over time is actually that just letting the parts of your life blend together, but then being good at understanding you know, how to manage it was a way better, a more effective strategy for me to figure out how to you know, be a person and an entrepreneur and a husband and a father. How do you do um, all that? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to figure it yeah, out. How do you I do mean, it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. In another million dollar business. If, uh, if you can figure out how to do that. I mean, I think it's really individual and really personal, you know, to, well, what works to the personal you? level, but you know, for me, what integration looks like is allowing myself to work when I have the inspiration and, uh, the clarity that creates great ideas or um, good thinking or, or just productivity and allowing myself to not work when I'm burned out or I'm just stuck or I've got, you know, a kid's dance recital or something sure. that I want to go to. And so my work day doesn't look like a nine to five. I'm kind of working all the time, mm-hmm. but also, you know, if I need to exercise or something, I very often just take off in the middle of the day and go do my thing. Now, it, it is something you have to learn about yourself, about sure. the way that you're effective, right? And for me, you know, really early mornings, um, often after my kids go to bed at night, those tend to be really productive times. Sure. For um, mid-afternoon is not a per- super productive time for me. Like, it's okay for, like, email and meetings and stuff like that, but I don't do my best thinking at that time of day. And so I kind of structure my day around um, when I can be effective. And then it also allows me to do things where – you know, if there's something that I have two daughters and they're in elementary school and if there's something going on, like I'll go there and I'll be a part of that. And, you know, that ends up being so much more meaningful for me than trying to keep a certain schedule at work Mm -hmm. that then sacrifices and trades off with those other things. Not saying that I have nailed it, not saying that at all, but you know, I think it's really about learning about yourself how you're effective and then being okay and and trying to shed the guilt that often comes with, and I'm I'm sure you've had it, right? It's like, well, you know, 
uh, I, I wish I could go do this at sure. three o'clock in the afternoon, but I'm not going to do that because if I walk out of this building, everybody in the, you sure. know, the company is going to be like, where is he going? Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I have the same, I don't shut off really. And so I kind of have to, I, the, the day it goes where it goes. And I think we're actually similar that <laughs> yeah. way. I try to just, okay, sometimes it's just going to go long. Sometimes I just got to do this thing. Yeah. Sometimes that day's crazy. Sometimes it's not so crazy and it's okay if it's not. Yeah, absolutely nuts, and you yeah. need to get out. So, w what about stress? How do you deal with stress? And you, you have to have a difficult conversation. You have to let someone go or something. And it's like there, there are certain things that just weigh on you. Oh, sure. So, how do you deal with all that? Yeah, I all mean, the fun stuff of running a, a mission, not only a business <laughs> but a mission-driven business. Yeah, that, you know, triple bottom line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, exercise is a big one for me. Um, I'm one of those people that starts to go a little mental if they don't get their exercise. My wife can see it. She'll I'll, sometimes I'll come home from work and she'll just look at me and she'll see it in my eyes. She's like, "Okay, you got to get out of here." I'm like, I know you've been gone all day, but like, get out of here. Go. So what do you go do? Go run around. Is it running or gym? Uh, or? You know, I'm I'm more of a all of the above kind of guy. Okay. Running is my exercise of last resort because I <laughs> find it really boring. Um, I I do a lot of outdoor sports. I do a lot of kiteboarding a lot of um, racing salt, small sailboats, do a lot of biking, that kind of stuff. So when I get the opportunity to do that stuff, I'll do that. But um, when I'm on the road, it's usually a jam or a, or, you know, a pair of running shoes. Um, that's a big one. But I've also learned, um, I, I actually going to a little bit more of a fireside chats kind of place. Um, <laughs> late in the, in the journey of method before we sold it, I really started to actually struggle with um, the stress. You know, it was really anxiety and stress sure. really started to get to me. Um, and one of the things I learned to do at that time, I actually learned to meditate uh, and started a, a practice, which is on and off for me. Sure. What type um, of meditation? It's Vedic med sure. meditation. Is which your is mantra, like, repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's like meditation for dummies, you know? <laughs> um, but I do actually find that that helps me a lot. Um, you know, again, my practice is not, uh, you know, all the time, but sure. it's something that's really helped me to just kind of like, uh, release all the kind of junk that builds up in your mind over the course of a day. Sure. So, I do the same thing. It works. All right. Yeah. It's hard to maintain, but if you, it, it definitely works. Yeah. And I, you know, I even find that even though I don't do it as often as I'm sure my, my meditation teacher would tell me I should, um, it, it's still, even when I haven't done for a while and I've said, you sure. know, I, I, this, I think this will help comes right back. Which teacher, who, which teacher did you learn? From I, were, I learned from a guy named James Brown, not to okay. be uh, confused with the Godfather yes. of soul, um, <laughs> who's a local teacher out in, uh, Got it. in San Francisco. Yeah. So any advice for a mission driven entrepreneur out there who's looking to build a business that has impact mm -hmm. and also actually has revenue. <laughs> yeah, revenue. <laughs> you need both. Yeah. Yeah. Revenue. Interesting concept. Um, so, so the first thing I would say is we're super fortunate to live in a place where you can start a business and even if it fails, you're going to learn a ton and mm -hmm. it's not a black mark. It's in fact, something that you can go and talk about the experience that you've had and will allow you to get other opportunities in the future. So I say that because there's most other places in the world, if you start a business and fall on your face, you're done, you're, you're, yeah. done. you're kind of screwed. So, so like recognize that and, and just go for it <laughs> because the process of it, or just not just the process of starting, but in the process of building a business, it, it'll take you directions. You'll learn things. You'll have experiences that are unlike things you would ever imagine that you would, you know, have the ability to do. So that's my like jump in <laughs> with both feet, really do it uh, kind of pep talk in terms of lessons. You know, for me, I think that the biggest le lesson is one of self-awareness, which may seem a little bit kind of out there, but it's huge. It, it being a business mm -hmm. teaches you an incredible amount about yourself and you've got to be open to what uh, it teaches you and you've got to be willing to learn and grow because the, because the business is going to learn and grow. And if you want to continue to lead it, you want to continue to have impact, whether that impact is social or environmental or, you know, even financial, whatever that impact is that you're trying to have, you're going to need to grow along with it and you're mm -hmm. going to need to listen. And, you know, for me, that was, has, and continues to be, you know, the, the sort of most interesting part of the journey. 
So is there anything that keeps you up at night? And mm -hmm. the flip side of that question is what has you excited in the morning? <laughs> yeah. yeah um, there are always things that keep me up at <laughs> night. Um, you know, for me, most of the things that keep me up are about execution because I'm a big believer that a decent strategy, well executed, will always be a perfect strategy with that's that's not executed as well. Hmm. And so I'm always thinking about what is this uh, product quality issue that's, you know, could pop up or what is, um, you know, what's happening in our channels of trade with retailers and how Amazon is impacting the sure. retail space, which is, you know, most of our products are sold at, at retail. Um, things like that that are pretty tactical and pretty executional in nature. But those are the things that I want to make sure as a founder and a CEO that I've got a really good handle on so that if things change, we can respond quickly in a way that's going to make our business better. So you're not like way up in the sky thinking, you know, big picture. I don't get involved in the details. Well, or execution I, I, or... I worry about execution. Now, now <laughs> my, my role is as a leader of the company, and I am very careful to, to not micromanage. Sure. I think I can say that um, and, and not have, have my uh, people throwing up. Um, I think they would agree. But, it is, but it's those things. I think I've worked really hard to try to get really tight strategies. I think we have a playbook that we know how to win, and mm -hmm. we have a right to win, and it's just a matter of doing what we need to do in order to, to get those things done. In terms of what gets me excited, yep. you know, with Ripple Foods specifically, what I talked about before is building a set of technologies around food that can help healthier, more sustainable foods scale worldwide is something I'm incredibly excited about. Um, we talked a tiny bit earlier about protein. Right now we make the cleanest, purest plant protein anywhere in the world. But in a matter of a year or two, we may also be making the cheapest plant protein protein anywhere in the world um, oh. using some waste byproducts of other types of uh, other types of food processes and that is where things can get really really interesting from not just going from reinventing the plant-based dairy space to make plant-based foods more desirable to a mainstream audience in the u.s but also internationally sure. and then going down more to the base of the pyramid where you can start to address, you know, malnutrition issues and things like sure. that. I get really, really excited about that. I also get kind of worried because I have no idea how to exploit those type of opportunities. But I think if we keep our head down and keep executing, sure. then those opportunities will be there if we do things right. So what is the vision? Where would you like to be in a year or three years from now? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would take it more... I'll go more three to five years if okay. I can. You can go yeah. five. Yeah. Most, most people yeah. get scared when I say five. <laughs> no, I get scared no. when I say five. <laughs> yeah, like, just give me a year. Three. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of pitfalls between here and there. Um, you know, for us, I think in, in three to five years, I want non-dairy brand in the United States. Okay, so all across the dairy regimen, milk, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, you name it, bringing really nutritious, more sustainable, super delicious um, foods across that that whole business. In the meantime, we're going to continue to develop our technology that will open up um, opportunities in other spaces, some of which we talked about and many others where there are opportunities in other food product spaces, in other geographies, and ultimately potentially at, at um, much more accessible price points mm -hmm. um, that will allow us to amplify the impact that we have with this business. I love that. So a nice lofty goal. Number one dairy, brand, number one non-dairy brand in, in America. Yeah. yeah, that's that's huge. So my last question, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice when you were first starting out in method, what advice would that be? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, not maybe at the risk of repeating myself, I would say know thyself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny. I was I started Method when I was 25, yep. and you know, 25 is an interesting time because you you know you know you you've, you know enough to be dangerous. You're <laughs> well educated, right? You're certainly passionate, um, but I didn't have a ton of experience under my belt, so I didn't have a lot of empirical evidence that would sort of taught me what I was really good at versus what I thought I was really good at. And it would have been nice to kind of know that a little quicker and learn that in a slightly less painful way. 
Um, and I think maybe we would have, you know, the road would have been a little bit easier. But um, I also think that, you know, the, the, the toughness of that journey is probably one of the reasons why it sticks with you um, sure. and why, why it's meaningful. So I don't know, maybe not. No, oh, I like that one. I couldn't agree more with that. The the, the rough parts of the journey are, are usually the ones where you, those those life lessons really sink in and have the most impact. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam Lowry, thank you so much for being here. Everyone check out Ripple Foods. New yogurts, everybody. All check right. them out. They're delicious. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.